This old service station is the starting point for the wild men of the Trans-Amazonian Highway. Say hi to Teo. All right then, bye. They're known locally as the Human Bombs. Nato and Maura are two of the band of fearless brothers. We're pumping 20,000 liters of diesel to take to the depths of the jungle. Now we'll not stop until we reach our destination. Surprisingly, Mauro makes only a cursory inspection of his truck before departing. He says there's little risk. His life is in the hands of the Almighty. Arriving in one piece, however, is considered an achievement. The road is bad. It's very difficult. My job is to deliver fuel to the gold diggers. Now it's a quagmire. The road is really terrible. Mauro has two days to get there. After that, each hour he's late will be deducted from his salary. It's a matter of pedal to the metal. Brazil is 13 times the size of Texas. Among some of these immense virgin territories, illegal gold diggers have built illegal roads and villages, such as Sipurizao, which is Mauro's destination. The village sprung up out of nothing six years ago and is on no map, and nor are most of the roads that lead there. These clandestine routes are the death of the Amazon forest. They're exploited by thousands of poor people drawn by the prospect of finding gold and especially ranchers who want to expand their farms. Each year, they destroy, quite illegally, tens of thousands of hectares of forest. Indians who live in the jungles are simply driven out. A devastating rush is underway. The region crossed by Mauro is a series of hills awash with water, forming a giant ice rink. Any poorly timed braking and the tanker can spin out of control. In December, a driver who didn't know the road was going downhill too quickly. And the curve caught him by surprise and he overturned in the middle of the road. Nobody ventures out alone on these roads. Mauro has a rendezvous with four other wild men to form a convoy. <laughs> Can you believe it? Juan says he'll be forced to tow me. Him with his rotten truck. He says I'm not going to get there. Who does he think he is? The nutter wants to climb the hill in fourth gear. Here we go then. Oh, in the winter, everyone drives together so we can help each other. Through the hills, one driver guides the others along the tracks already plowed up by other trucks, thereby reducing the risk of sliding sideways off the road. Mauro tries to do his own thing but he's soon put into his place. He surfs downhill, a technique that not all drivers are able to perform. A little later, one of them ends up in the ditch. I didn't take the right tracks, and that immediately took me over to the side. But uh, they'll soon tow me out. All right, chump, this should do it.
but the 25-ton tanker will give them a hard time. It takes one hour to cover 20 meters. Now we have to speed things along, because if it rains, we'll be stuck. Like Neto, most drivers can't stand the snaking mud path that often keeps them from their families for weeks at a time. Winter's always the worst time. The trucks get busted, we overturn. In winter, I stock up with biscuits and apples to make sure I won't go hungry, because it has taken us two months to make the round trip in the past. Fortunately for the drivers, when the track is virtually impassable, there is no deduction from wages. The heavyweights are not the only ones to venture onto this track. Gold diggers and farmers seeking new land throng here in their hundreds. They all hope to make their fortunes. Some, like George, take the opportunity to do some business. He's fortunate in having a four-wheel drive, so he improvises as a taxi driver. Given the risks, he charges three times the usual rates. Come on, you can move ahead. Come on. Here in the para, it's a big mess. Everyone is ready to kill each other for a piece of land. There's no property deeds. The state rarely issues any. Four poles are enough to mark out one's territory. The farmers are the first to grab the land. The richer ones even pay for road maintenance. Always in search of pastures, they pave the way for their huge herds. They drive thousands of cows ever deeper into the jungle. I'm going to my new farm, uh, which is about 500 kilometers away. Here I don't have enough pastures for my 5,000 head of cattle. It'll probably take us 60 days to get there. Stuck behind the herd, Mauro and his convoy lose a lot of time. A delay they'll need to make up by driving at night. Just three years ago, all this was a majestic forest. I'm waiting for 1,500 bulls. The farm is 130 hectares. And if you count the forest that we will clear, it will be five to six hundred acres of pasture land. Itamar, age 23, is a vaqueros, a cowboy. His boss gave him the horse, the house, a pair of boots, and even comprehensive insurance. If an animal breaks my leg or hurts one of my children, the boss is responsible for the insurance. They call him and he sends a car or a plane to get us out of here. But, but my salary goes down as I recover, though. Uh, how much do you make, in fact? Uh, the equivalent of 570 euros a month. Itamar will set up a feast for his men by picking out one of the bulls. The vaqueros stuns the beast by strangling it with his lasso. The bull struggles, 
probably aware that its life is at an end. And the lack of air causes it to collapse. Then with a deft flick of the knife, Itamar removes the animal's male attributes. Okay, let it go. Oof, I was scared, he jumped on me. Grill testicles are a delicacy much prized in the region. It's for the aperitif. We savor these testicles. It makes the bulls fatten up more quickly and after 18 months, they're sent to the slaughterhouse. There's no demand for uncastrated animals abroad, so they're castrated for export. Itamar's herd gets larger each year, so yet more forest needs to be destroyed to make room for more pastures. In short, an ecological disaster. This road is like a scar, and the drivers know it well, as this hill seems insurmountable. So what's happening? Well, the ruts are too deep, there's too much mud. Listen, nobody's made it up. Uh, we'll need to be towed. As if by magic, a tractor shows up. It seems that this mess is not natural, but carefully maintained in this state so these people can make a little money. How much is the tow? 90 euros. For each truck? Yep. That's good for you then. Yes, but on sunny days we're not needed. As everything's dry. For 360 euros the four trucks are pulled out of the mud. Illegal roads are not the only threats to the Amazon rainforest. The construction of the third largest dam in the world, called Belo Monte, will eventually swallow up an area the size of Paris. Equipped with 27 giant turbines, it will produce 10% of Brazil's electricity needs. The waters inexorably rise and gradually flood Indian territory. 25,000 indigenous people were unceremoniously dispossessed and without any effective resettlement policy. Many now have nowhere to go and end up in the slums of large cities such as Altamira. Zila and her family are Kayapo Indians. They were evicted a few days ago along with their seven children and are now squatting with cousins. We can't afford to buy a house in town. Zila and her family's enforced wandering is just beginning. The construction site of the dam has attracted 80,000 workers to Altamira and rents have skyrocketed. Even the poorer areas have become unaffordable. Zila returns home to pick up a few personal possessions. Because of the dam, the water is burying my island. But that's where I have pigs, chickens, ducks, and a dog, and all my stuff. We have to be quick because the water is seeping into the basement and everything is being sucked in. <laughs> 
After two hours, the small boat comes face to face with a huge dam. Just a few months ago, there was nothing here. The local Indians could roam freely, but now they have to use a special kind of lock, just inaugurated by the people behind the dam project. We've just come from Altamira. Good morning, what's your name? Zila Tavares da Peña. How are you, Zila? Their canoe is towed by a tractor that brings it to the other side of the dike. A brand new four-wheel drive then transports Zila and her family. Zila is annoyed. The operation has taken about an hour. I find it weird. We used to be able to go straight down the river. And now we have to wait to pass. I just want to ask you a few questions. We'll go quickly as it's already very hot. What is your tribe? Kayapo. Yes, we're both from the same tribe. Kayapo, okay. Do you think this transfer system is comfortable, safe, effective? Yes, it's sufficient. Uh, I'd like to ask you something. The lady's husband says their house is being flooded much faster than expected. Who could I check this with? The engineers? Let me check. Because of the dam, the water is polluted. We can no longer drink it or wash or cook with it. The Indians are well aware that whatever happens, nothing will change now. It's delayed our journey a lot. It's a lousy transfer, there's nothing good about it. It's the destruction of our river. arrive at their home, Zila sees the water has engulfed her garden. And before, their hut was about 50 meters from the shore. Well, the problem is that you can do nothing to stop rising water. Zila's animals are hungry. They haven't been fed for several days. I'm worried about my animals. I don't know what will happen to them. Or to me, for that matter. Only God knows. I feel sad. Because... Well, because we had to struggle to build this house. The Kayapo earn their living from harvesting and fishing. Cecilio and his son head off to check the nets they'd had to abandon when they left. They should be filled with fish by now. Instead, he's shocked by the color of the water. A dead fish floats on the surface. In fact, the water has become unsuitable for any form of animal life. Once immersed, plants and trees eventually ferment and the water becomes acidic, killing the fish. The water is too dirty and now there's a strong current. It stops the nets from reaching the riverbed. And anyway, fish don't live in dirty water. We can't survive by fishing anymore. They dumped rocks in the water and the mud rose and, and changed the color of the water.
The acidic water also causes skin diseases, such as the kind Zila's son caught while washing. It's because I didn't know what was happening, so when I bathed, my, my skin became like that. In a few hours, the whole family will head off on a long trip to an uncertain destination. The downpour does not bode well for the convoy. The track was turning into a small river. Lower down, the descent is awful. Oh, it's really bad for trucks. It's full of ruts. Most drivers would wait until the rain stops. But the threat of having pay deducted spurs Mauro and his men to take the wheel. The track is made of clay, and unlike normal soil that absorbs rain and causes trucks to get bogged down, clay is waterproof. And it rapidly transformed the road into a sticky skating rink. When it rains, it's best to avoid having to break. There are a lot of deep ruts here, so one wrong move and you've had it. Frustrated by the delays, Mara goes too fast and takes too many risks. We need to get over this hill before it rains too much or it'll be hell. Braking or steering too abruptly and Mauro will be in trouble. The weight of the truck carries it along, sliding and spinning towards a ditch. No, it's no way. This can't be true. Now I've had it. If the truck leans over any more, it'll tip right over. It depends how much you use the accelerator. Mauro tours the truck to check there's been no damage. Some gold hunters in a quad pull over. Hey, dude, have everything okay? Hello, my lovely. My love, how are you? Good. How are you, madam? Hello, sir. How's this old thug doing, then? Poor thing's got malaria. It rained and he caught malaria. The road's slippery. I was going downhill and I got stuck in the ditch. We will have a job to get my colleague down. The front of the truck is heavy. We'll have to dig to get it upright again. The track holds the last truck hostage. In these conditions, the only technique to go downhill is to guide the truck along the road furrows. Neto, the driver, is worried. No, no, no. Dig this way. No, I'm going to dig deeper. Neto orders the others, but does little work himself. Mind out, will you? Yeah, but... No, no, come on, get out of the way. Even stuck in the middle of the forest, Neto is like a maniac. Come on. Come on, then. And without warning, Neto surges ahead. Mind now, get out of the way. In this deeply religious country, there is always a church, even deep in the forest. The Church of the Perfect Praise has taken on the task of teaching the children of gold hunters catechism once a week. So, are we going or not? Come on, let's go. God is with us. The driver, Pedro, however, has some serious doubts. Uh, let me have a look at these clouds there. The Almighty seems to have abandoned them. The slippery slope is impassable for his old pickup. Hey, Mr. Chauffeur, come on, we can go on foot. No, we have to walk up and down, it's too far. No, it's just over there, it's not that far. 
I will get dirty and wet. Pedro doesn't want to take the risk of sliding downhill and ending up in a ditch, with all the children in the back. So patent leather shoes and little ballet shoes will have to brave the mud. The flirtatious nature of the Brazilian female is not just a legend. Neither mud nor technical stress scared this lady who heads into town to go shopping with her fiancé. Now, this happens every day. The chain's too heavy and it gets loose. You'll try and put it back if you can, and then we'll go on. Like most people here, there are gold hunters. A beautiful nugget could change their lives. The lady dreams of a gleaming four-wheel drive. Oh, when it's sunny, it's fine to wear nice shoes, but when it rains, well, there's no point, really. a few hundred gold miners here when they first made this clandestine track to reach their digs. Since then, three villages have sprung up in which nearly 10,000 people now live. The state has been forced to legalize these settlements, and a first step was to make the road passable to all vehicles. The most economical way is to cover it with stones, but work has ground to a halt. Stones are rare in the forest, so as soon as there's a house to build, the population helps itself, especially the farmers. Our boss is building a shed, so these stones are for him. It's a shed for storing cocoa. We work in, in cocoa. The stones later on are ground up to make the road, you see. Once refurbished, the tracks will become well-surfaced national routes. The smooth and straight line is much welcomed, and after all the bumps and holes, Mauro puts his foot down. Is it the clutch? The mechanism's breaking down. Ah, that's the differential that's broken. Ah, it's no good. We'll have to undo everything. It has to be dismantled. It breaks down because these rotten roads destroy everything. It's complex machinery that they will take their time to dismantle on the side of the road. The guy who put this differential together didn't screw the bolt properly. And now it's broken. Look, this is what's damaged. It's the bolt inside. We'll reassemble everything and then we'll head off. But will their repair job hold up? the banks of the river Shingu, the Kayapo Indians, Cecilio and Zila, are emptying their house before it's swallowed up by the waters. Because of the dam, the water will reach here in just a few days. The 
the small family's entire life is packed onto these two canoes. They have no room for their pigs and chickens, who are abandoned to their fate. Dam waters have forced 25,000 natives out, and most are now homeless. It's the last chance for the kids to have a swim before heading to a makeshift camp. family can sleep at a friend's house tonight. But tomorrow... <laughs> Only God knows where we'll end up. I live in anguish 24 hours a day. I too have to leave because of the rising waters. Our destiny is in the hands of God. The next day, Zila and her family leave the land where they were born. Those uprooted in the name of progress begin a long journey into an uncertain future. They were told that there might be a plot of land available somewhere a long way off. The trip ends on foot in the sweltering heat. Here is the promised land occupied by some of the tribe. All this was pasture land, which we've now occupied. I'm scared the police will show up any minute now and we'll be expelled again. Within a day or two, Zila and her husband build a small wooden hut with plastic for a roof, or rather an oven, with temperatures rising to 50 degrees during the day. There's no shade. It's very hot all day long. I don't like it here. Even the kids are unhappy. It was better on the banks of the Shingu. At least there was a lot of water. And there, to meet the needs of the family, Zila, her husband and her brother lived by fishing. Selling the fish provided an income. But now they are far from the river, so how can they earn a living? The solution may lie out of sight in the depths of the forest. The track leads to the hope of a better life. Zila's brother appears to have caught gold fever. Former fishermen converted to gold diggers have swarmed all over this hill. Cecilia would like to open his own mine. Could you explain how you work? Is, is that yellow stuff gold? No, it's just the yellow earth near the vein. Ah, right. Uh, what if suddenly you came across a large nugget of gold? Ah, that'd be nice. You have to survive only with what you can extract, though. Sometimes you can go a year without finding anything. Uh, oh, right, so the prospector's life is a life of adventure. Up to a year without pay, not a very encouraging statement. After three hours of work, the men sieve the earth in a puddle. Yeah, I found half a gram. Worth about 15 euros. 
This is far from enough to feed his family. In Brazil, life is almost as expensive as in Europe. Cecilio is disappointed. Fishing brought in more, and it was less dangerous. In all this wall that I dug, there is no gold. There's just a tiny vein down there. Ah, so you have to dig further down to find the vein. See, that's where you can find gold. Here's where there is gold. But it's dangerous, because if a large chunk of earth comes loose, it can break your neck just like that. Five men died in the next hole over there. The choice is take risks or starve. There would be one solution. There are still men wanted to construct the dam. But the Indians refuse to work there, as they refuse anything to do with the enemy. The party is in full swing at night in Altamira. Revelers in fancy dress welcome the thousands of construction workers from the dam who live in town. They've just been paid, and a lot of it will be frittered away this evening. On the balcony, the deputy mayor is delighted with this windfall. For his town, the building site is synonymous with expansion, with money and modern infrastructure. Altamira will soon have the appearance of a big city. There are 20,000 people who've come from all over Brazil. It will help the region to develop. The dam means we will have electricity for our country, and we'll be able to sell some to neighboring countries too. This is a great company for Brazil, and it's Altamira, our city, that will benefit. <laughs> That's our people. They work for us, but we share out the wealth. This year, the wealth is going towards the ball. Money from the consortium is flowing through Altamira. The consortium that manages the work has helped finance the huge carnival, and it's not out of kindness. They know that in Brazil, Samba has the power to stifle the cries of the most vocal environmental protesters. Mauro is chasing daylight, the engine cranked up. He's trying to cover as many kilometers as possible before nightfall. Those are a challenge, those truck headlights. The headlights are powerful, but not enough to show up the traps. In the dark, it's the driver's reflexes that make the difference. where the bog starts, and it's very slippery. The oncoming headlights are too close for comfort. Oh, you won't make it. Why? Because there's a truck that's fallen into a big hole further up. So how many trucks are stuck? Three in front and two behind. Can't we tow them out? No. What happened? Well, a truck full of grain slid and it's now stretched across the road. Any small vehicles can make it past. So, you'll see the girls tonight? No, not tonight. Uh, the other day, though, you had a good time, right? You didn't get to bed. Okay, have a safe journey. Mauro has no choice, he has to go on. He relies on his experience to help rescue the unfortunate driver. He'd recognize the truck anywhere. It's part of his convoy and belongs to Neto. He was also driving quickly, trying to avoid the night. But the night caught up with him and tricked him. So what happened? Well, to make the climb up, I, I built up speed, and, but then I slid and I found myself right in it. Now you'll need a tractor. More like two big trucks to pull that out. One isn't powerful enough. Are you carrying timber? Yep. Cut? Yep. 
These truckers are transporting precious woods, illegally chopped down. Their presence is a boon, as the trucks have very powerful four-wheel drive engines to avoid getting bogged down and eventually caught by police patrols. The two trucks take up position to tow NATO out, but all three will have to accelerate at the same time. Who'll give the signal? We need everyone to pull together. The cable breaks. The nut holding the loop broke, you see. The cable is quickly repaired. Whoa, whoa. Both trucks force the pace. And NATO's truck is eventually pulled free. But not without some damage. There's oil leaking. Oh, it's engine oil. Bad news for Mauro. The two timber trucks headed off quickly, and now it's his turn to get stuck. I slid into the ditch. If I reverse, maybe I can get it out again. It's an endless struggle for Mauro and his mates. Since their departure two days earlier, they've been spared nothing. Holes, ditches, breakdowns, mud. We'll pull you, you just steer. Yet nobody gets upset. Nobody gives up as they all fight this track that seems determined to make them lose part of their salary. Well done. Everything okay? Well, the bumper's a bit broken. They'll never make up the time lost by this latest delay. When they get to Crepurizao, their destination, it's four o'clock in the morning. And they've been driving for 18 hours. This is a city created by the gold miners. We've made it. We're here. In this city that never sleeps, the temptations are great. But this time, Mauro is really tired. I'm exhausted. We did it. Finally. The trip went well, thank God. Mauro will spend the night here at the fuel warehouse. This is the store where we will offload the fuel. And it's uh, there that we can sleep. When you want to rest, you just open up a hammock and the women will come and serve us. When there's no more room, some spend the night on the roof of their truck. 
According to them, it's much safer than a cheap hotel. We sleep here because the temperature is nicer, it's cooler. Plus here it's less dangerous. The hotel is tucked away down there. It's a dark and poorly lit area. And it's stuffed to bursting. Many of the guys are drunk and haven't been drinking all day and all night. So to avoid any trouble, we prefer it up here. The next day, the village slowly sobers up. This is my life. Sometimes I look for gold. Yeah, right. He looks for gold in the bar drinking. Oh, I had a bag with all my clothes and they stole everything. All you do is drink. You don't even try and get a job to afford to buy new clothes. Look at how swollen your feet are from drinking so much. On the riverfront, the fuel continues on its way to the gold mining sites. These boats carry passengers as well as goods and especially fuel. They carry all the gold diggers who are on the river. They use the fuel to power their water pumps. And it's not just fuel the miners consume in large quantities. All these beers, they'll barely be enough for a week. There are a thousand people to deliver this to. It's a two-day trip. For a few grams of gold, thousands of men are massacring the forest with their hoses and pumps. But the hope of a better life overcomes any qualms about the destruction. Yeah, the only choice people have is to look for gold. It's a lottery. Some are lucky, others are not. A lottery for millions of people. But there's only ever one winner. I still haven't found a seam to make me rich. The forest is dying, and according to one scientific study, it would take hundreds of years to return to its original state.